Well, all right, children, it's Hank Hill, dang nabbit, and we're going to talk about how the Great Compromise and the Electoral College came to be. So listen up. In 1787, okay, delegates from the 13 American states came together for the Constitutional Convention. Their plan was to design a system for a new United States government. During the convention, there was a heated dispute over the question of congressional representation. And dang it, that means how many representatives would be in Congress, in the government, darn it? So states with larger populations, they wanted representation based on population, which made sense because they're bigger, dang it. And the smaller states wanted equal representation, dang it, because they're the same as any other state, and they shouldn't be penalized for being so small. To get the convention from dissolving into chaos, the Founding Fathers came up with the Great Compromise. The agreement created today's system of congressional representation. Bobby, I hope you're listening, Bobby. Dang, Bobby. It's, it now influences everything from pork barrel legislation to the way votes are counted in the Electoral College. Pork barrel means you give someone extra stuff for their state so that they'll vote for your law. Agree to a system of representation. The Constitutional Convention was held in 1787. Delegates from larger states believed each state's representation in the newly proposed Senate should be proportionate or relative to the population. Under this system, states with larger populations would have more representatives in the Senate. States with smaller populations would have fewer representations. So if you were from the great state of Texas, like me and Peg, then you'd have more representation. The smaller states argued that this, argument, this arrangement would give the larger states too much power in the government. What if you're little itty bitty New Hampshire and you're trying to go up against Texas, the mightiest state of all, dang nabbit? They argued that each state should have equal representation regardless of the population. The disagreement over representation threatened to prevent the U.S. Constitution from being a approved. Delegates from both sides of the dispute vowed to reject the document if they did not get their way. The solution came in the form of a compromise. Compromise is like you get worse things and I get worse things, but we're happy because we got some things. A compromise is when you both agree to give up something you want to make the other person happy. This solution came in the form of a compromise proposed by the statesman Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut. The compromise was also known as the Sherman Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise. The deal combined the two proposals from Virginia, a large state, and New Jersey, a small state. The Great Compromise Approved. According, Bobby, Bobby, are you listening, Bobby Hill? Bobby, according to the Great Compromise, Congress would have two houses. Members of the House of Representatives would be allocated according to each state's population and elected by the people. So the House of Representatives has people based on the number of population you have based on the census every 10 years, Bobby. In the second house, the Senate, each state would have two representatives, regardless of the state size, Bobby. 
The senators would be chosen by the state legislature. In 1913, the 17th Amendment was passed, changing the system so that senators would be elected by the people. The plan was approved by a slim margin on July 23rd, 1787. At the time of the Constitutional Convention, states' populations varied. However, they did not vary by nearly as much as they do today. One of the main effects of the Great Compromise is that states with smaller populations have a disproportionately bigger voice in the nation's Congress. Because if you're small like Wyoming, you should only really have half of a representative, maybe one, but they get two anyway. In California, which has millions and millions of people, they only get two anyway. So it's not really fair system because the small states get more say. The balancing act of power. George Edwards III is a political scientist at the Texas A&M University. California has about 68 times more people than Wyoming, he says. Yet both states, Bobby, have the same number of votes in the Senate. The founders never imagined the great difference in the population of states that existed today. Edward says, if you happen to live in a low population state, you get a disproportionately larger say in American government. The imbalance of power in the Senate has major consequences. Business interests in those states such as mining in West Virginia or hog farming in Iowa are more likely to get attention. They are also more likely to get money from the government. Todd Estes is a historian in Oakland University. In the Senate, when they're trying to get to 51 votes to pass a bill, every vote counts, he says. That's when the smaller states can demand amendments and additions to the bill to look out for their own state's interest. Such benefits are often called or referred to as pork barrel legislation. So I give you some extra things for your state if you vote for my bill. And that little state doesn't really have that going on, but they get a benefit because they are equal vote. What is the small state bias? Well, Bobby, the principle of protecting small states through equal representation in the Senate carries over into the Electoral College. It is the body of people who officially vote to elect the president. Each state is assigned a certain number of electoral votes. The number is based on the state's combined number of representatives in the House and the Senate. Wyoming has the smallest population in all the states, and it only has three votes in the Electoral College. California is the largest state, and it has 55 electoral votes. However, each of Wyoming's votes represents a smaller group of people than each of California's votes. Some scholars see the small state bias in the Senate as critical. The arrangement means that power in the Senate is distributed geographically, not by the population. It guarantees that interests across the entire country are represented in Congress. Greg L. Gary L. Gregg II is a political scientist in the University of Louisiana, Louisville, sorry, Louisville. In a 2012 article, he argues that major cities already have equal power. They serve as major media, academic, and government centers. The structure of the Senate, he says, ensures that interests of rural and small town Americans are preserved. So the battle has been going on for many, many, many years since the beginning. If you have a small state like Wyoming, you could be overvoted.
But if you have a big state like California, you get 55 votes. So they have to make sure they include you. But other people argue the small states still don't have as many people and they don't get as much say. So large states which have the media and universities and government centers, they get more say because they're controlling what people understand and know. The other side would be we're really given the land the right to vote. The state of Wyoming gets three votes, even though there's not very many people there. Where New York has lots of people, they should get lots of votes. So what did the founding fathers intend? Well, Peg, if you listen here for a minute, you're going to find out. It was that the intention of the founding fathers. Was that the intention of the founding fathers? Edwards is doubtful since the majority of Americans at the time of the Constitutional Convention came from rural areas, not urban. No one was thinking about protecting rural interests, Edwards says. Those interests were already powerful at the time. The Great Compromise's arrangement of delegates in the Senate might or might not be fair. However, it is unlikely to ever change. This is because equal representation in the Senate is specifically protected in the Constitution. Article 5 says that no state can lose its equal representation in the Senate without the state's permission. No state is likely willing to give up their say in the Senate because that's two votes, just like California gets two votes. So, the small states get to be equal in that area. And to turn that rule over, you'd have to have them agree that they didn't want to have equal representation. Now, who's going to do that, Bobby? Who? All right, well, this is Hank Hill signing off. You all go learn some information. And don't forget about the great state of Texas. Hallelujah.